Welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to grow in knowledge of God by coming to know ourselves and what we were made for. By bridging the gap between the intellect and the will, we have the capacity to understand our nature and grow as disciples of Christ by striving to surrender all that we are and all that we have to the truth. My name is Angela Erickson, and I have another great episode lined up. I interviewed Francis Beckwith. He is a doctor of philosophy over at Baylor University uh, to talk about Roe versus Wade, abortion, and kind of the implications for that uh, on a larger scale when we look at other issues in our culture today. Um, It was a really, really great interview, but... (laughs) There were some technical issues, and so I really want to thank Dr. Beckwith for his patience because actually most of the issues happened before we started recording, thank God. Um, It was a struggle bus that day, and I have some ideas on what that might have been, and I'm hoping to have that remedied in the future. But uh, Dr. Beckwith, if you are listening, thank you so much for your patience and persistence as we kind of worked our way through the interview. There are two instances in which either um, my audio dropped and I had to come back on or like I had to zip off. And so like, I can't remember exactly what happened. Um, I want to say that when I edited it, edited it, um, you can't tell hopefully, but there were moments when my audio dropped and I had to come back on. I think there are two moments you'll see, um, where we just kind of like jump in the images. If you are if you are watching this on YouTube, you probably won't really notice um, if you're listening in the podcast. So anyway, I just wanted to make note of that. Um, there was also a slight delay, and I'm not sure uh, what exactly was the cause of that, but hopefully that won't be too much of an issue if it will. If it is, um, I might have to change recording platforms. But I wanted to throw that out there so that you're not surprised when you're listening to it, but it shouldn't really be that bad. Um, Anyway, I really enjoyed this interview and I wish that we could have even gone further into some of these other issues that we discussed. I mean, we we even spent a fair amount of time talking about adoption and surrogacy, uh, which I don't think it's enough discourse today because we're really afraid of offending people. So, um, and another thing that I wanted to note too, is that we do talk about some of the we try to address the philosophy of the pro-life position. And I love that he is friends with pro-choice or pro-abortion philosophers. And some of you might not agree with that. Um, I think we tend, we like our echo chambers today. And I'm definitely somebody who thinks that iron sharpens iron. And uh, I think it speaks a lot also to Dr. Beckwith's character that he can maintain friendships with people that he disagrees with and who criticizes his work and he likewise um, criticizes their work and they can still be friends. And I think it's a good model for us to have. Um, That's not to say that we don't want philosophers who are pro-choice to change their mind and and support life and defend life. Um, But um, I, I do think it speaks a lot to his character and I think it's something that we all should strive for. And lastly, I also wanted to know another thing of patience. Um, Dr. Beckwith was super kind when I misspoke and said that his book is, I think I said it was called um, A Defense for Life or something. And I think I was putting together a, a book by Francis or by um, Scott Klusendorf and mixing the titles with his. Anyway, again, the book that you are going to want to buy after you listen to this interview is Defending Life, A Moral and Legal Case Against Abortion Choice. So Wanted to get that out there. Make sure you get it on your to-buy list. And I hope that you enjoy this interview. If you have not subscribed to Integrated with Angela Erickson, please do find me on whatever platform you want to. Make sure you subscribe, hit like, share, and um, check out my YouTube channel too. I'm going to be putting more content on there shortly. And I have some great ideas, but I'd also love to know from you what you would like to see. Anyway, that was a long intro. I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Francis J. Beckwith. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Beckwith, for coming on to Integrated with me today. Um, I would just really love for you to have a chance to introduce who you are and a little bit of your background before we get started. Sure. I'm a uh, professor of philosophy and church-state studies at Baylor University 
in Waco, Texas, have been here since uh, 2003. I just ended my 19th year on the faculty. Uh, my background is in philosophy. I uh, grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, and went to undergraduate uh, school there at University of Nevada, and then went on to graduate school at Fordham University in New York City, where I studied mostly uh, uh, philosophy of religion. I was interested in questions of faith and reason and how best uh, to think about those issues. And then uh, 11 years after earning my PhD, I went to law school at Washington University in St. Louis, where I studied law. And since 2003, have, as I've already mentioned, have, and have been at Baylor, and I write in areas and teach in areas concerning applied ethics, a philosophy of religion, and political philosophy. Excellent. Yeah, I actually first came into contact with your work back early in my um, pro-life activist days when I started to really dive into apologetics. And the book of yours that I encountered, I still have it, it's called um, A Defense for Life. And um, I would love for you, first of all, thank you so much for writing this book, because it's one thing I love about your writing is it's very accessible. And sometimes it's really hard to find when you talk to individuals who are into philosophy or even the theology. Um, it, it's not very accessible for the average <laughs> average intellect, <laughs> I guess you could say, like mine. Um, but I really do appreciate you talk about the moral and legal case for abortion choice. And um, obviously this is a hot topic right now with the Supreme Court decision having been leaked. And um, I just... Re it's kind of frustrating. I mean, you you just came back on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know if you regret it yet or not. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions on every side of this issue, right? Like a lot of people think they know what they're talking about when it comes to Roe. Um, but the, the sad reality is, is that even if you think you know about the decision and the history of the decision, everything, um, the truth is you probably don't. And so I wanted to have you on today to talk a little bit more about Roe as a, as a legal case, whether or not, um, you know, we could dive into the history a little bit and then move into some apologetics and talk about its further implications down the road and in our culture in general. So, sure. you know, as, as we talk about Roe, what could you maybe just describe an outline for the case for people who aren't familiar with um, what Roe versus Wade actually is? Yeah, so Roe v. Wade was a case involving a Texas statute. Uh, it was a law, law in Texas, which was similar to laws in virtually every state in 1971. When I think the case, I think the case actually begins in 1970 in the state of Texas, and eventually is decided by the Supreme Court in January of 1973. But it begins with a challenge to Texas's statute, which prohibited abortion, except for in cases of life of the mother. It actually did not allow it for rape and incest, or even uh, severe venal deformity. And uh, the case uh, is brought by a woman named Norma McCorvey. Her pseudonym was Jane Rowe. Uh, Wade was actually the district attorney of Dallas who would have prosecuted, who would have been involved with the prosecution of Lee Harvey Oswald if he had lived, if he had not, that was the guy that shot uh, JFK. So interesting sort of historical yeah. connection there. Uh, so they challenge the law, and you've got to remember what's going on in the United States during this time. It's the early 1970s. Uh, in the early 60s, there was a push by the American Medical Association, uh, the American Legal Institute, uh, to liberalize Americans, America's abortion laws. And what they mean by liberalization was nothing really would, would, would not be perceived as radical today. In fact, they would be perceived as fairly conservative laws to allow yes. uh, f you know, abortion for severe fetal deformity, rape and incest, and life of the mother. And so what happened is certain states, beginning with Colorado, and I think after that, I think New York, uh, California, Georgia had a law that liberalized uh, abortion, but it was actually overturned by the Supreme Court in a case called Doe vs. Bolton because it was not uh, liberal enough. Uh, and so by the time we get to Roe v. Wade, we have a country that is already debating abortion, uh, but vast majority of states have laws like Texas's. Supreme Court 
Here's the case, and the court says that not only is Texas's law unconstitutional, but every law like Texas is unconstitutional in every state, but even laws that are more liberal than Texas's laws are unconstitutional because the state has no interest in protecting prenatal life until uh, viability or, or after the second trimester of, of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And even then, uh, the court says that the unborn human being is not constitutionally a person. The state may restrict abortion in the third trimester, but doesn't have to. And even if it does, it has to allow for exceptions based on health and life of the mother and health and life defined in such a broad way yeah. pretty much means de facto abortion on demand throughout pregnancy. So yeah, in terms of the... To, go ahead. Sorry. I just... One thing I think is a, an important historical note, too, is that with the decision of Roe versus Wade, what many people don't realize is that pregnancy was never referred to in trimesters up until this legal decision um, because they were trying to define a, an appropriate time to permit abortion. Um, and, and so when you're talking about pregnancy, yes, all of a sudden you have, you have tr this trimester model. And I mean, think about how we talk about pregnancy today. I mean, everyone refers to, uh, you know, pregnancy ha happening first of all, um, and speaking with the AMA, the American Medical Association, having redefined when um, pregnancy begins from the moment of fertilization to the moment that the embryo implants into the uterus. That's a, that's a definition that was changed over time as a result of, of some of this, but also the language about how we talk about pregnancy and viability. And as I'm sure you will note, but viability changes as technology advances. Um, and that's, just, that's something that they weren't anticipating with this legislation. And it's one of its weaknesses um, as the decision was ruled. So um, just wanted to add that note in there. Sure. Yeah, that, that, that's, all, that's all very true. The, uh, the reason why the court does this, okay, so there's another case the Supreme Court dealt with about eight years earlier called Griswold v. Connecticut. It was a case that dealt with a Connecticut statute that prohibited the buying and selling and use of contraception. And it was a very, in a, in a sense, it was a narrowly decided case. It, it, it just said that uh, the right of privacy of a married couple to make decisions about intimacy is a sort of fundamental right, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. It's sort of presupposed by our laws. And so the court, you know, affirms this right of privacy in order to ground right to contraceptive use. Well, Roe v. Wade poses, a, or, or abortion poses a, a different problem than contraception, right? Because contraception meaning to prevent conception simply involves uh, two individuals who choose to use methods that prevent the woman from getting pregnant. Whereas in abortion, you have a third party, you have a fetus, an right. embryo. And so the court has to deal with this question. So how do you deal with the presence of the embryo? I mean, if you wanna ground the right to abortion in the right of privacy, that's a bit of a stretch if you have a third party. And in addition to that, you also, right. it's not really private, right? You go to a hospital, you, the, the, the procedure is oftentimes performed by doctors and nurses that you'd never met before, right? So I, it's, it's weird to call right. it privacy. I mean, it's, that it in itself the whole is, community. is you know, that's correct. I mean, in a broader it, it sense, says it's right? How, because they, yeah. It tells us something about who we are, right? So when when the government says that unborn human beings are not part of the human community, they're saying that when I was an embryo, I wasn't part of the human community, right? It's not simply affirming the right of somebody to act so that they are able to survive or defend themselves. It is making a claim about the nature of all of us. And so the idea yes. that you can sort of have a neut neutral abortion law in the sense that it doesn't tell us anything about the deep meaning of life is, is, is I think, a, a kind of conceit of the modern world, that the idea that we can mm -hmm. sort of do these things without having any impact or effect upon the way we think about other people. Um, so, so, yeah, so the role, let me tell you how the reasoning went. So, so, you, so, so you got this problem, right? You got the embryo. What do, you, what do you do with the embryo? Well, the court 
also had to deal with the fact that every state in the union up until the mid 60s prohibited abortion. And in the 19th century, when the 14th Amendment was passed, I think two thirds of the states, if not more, had abortion that had laws that prohibited abortion. And the argument that the court made was that the woman's liberty to have an abortion is grounded in the 14th Amendment, the portion of it that says life, liberty and property shall not be taken without due process of law. So what do you do with that? Well, Blackman gave, just as Blackman wrote the majority, gave a couple of arguments. One was, well, those 19th century abortion laws were just there to protect women from dangerous operations. They weren't there to protect uh, unborn human beings. Now that abortions are generally safe, there's no need to have the law. And besides, uh, before those statutes were written in the common law, that is the law that we inherited from England, from its courts, uh, women generally had a right to terminate their pregnancy. All of that is completely false. And one of the things that Justice Alito does, I think, masterfully in his leaked opinion is to show that that reasoning is completely fallacious, that it's based on bad historical arguments, that the literature over the past 45 years or so that has been critical of Roe, even written by people that are supportive of abortion rights, have are kind of embarrassed by this, right? I mean, they they realize that this is just not grounded historically. And then the other argument that he dealt with was Texas's argument. So the state of Texas says, um, okay, we believe that by passing this law, we are protecting, we are, we are actually abiding by Congress's uh, command to us to protect all persons uh, under our jurisdiction in the fort, as told to us by the 14th Amendment. And so we, we think that fetuses are persons and this law is to protect them uh, according to the 14th Amendment. And Blackman says, oh, and by the way, uh, Texas uh, uh, appeals to these this wonderful amicus brief that was put together by a group of pro-life physicians in which they go over the facts of fetal development, the humanity of the unborn. So Blackman says, um, you know, I am conversant with the well-known facts of human development, but since experts disagree about when life begins, the court at this moment in the history of human knowledge is not in this position to speculate or something along those lines. And so that's it. I mean, so, so basically it was a kind of hand wave, right? And it right. turns out that, that that second argument is, is, is so incredibly weak in this regard. So imagine if somebody were to tell you um, that they're going to act in a way that will put in danger other people, but there's a chance, but they have a right to do it because no one knows whether there are people really there. That is to say, if they were to act negligently, right, you're supposed to get room. in your car. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, they they go hunting with a blind... You know, they go hunting with a blindfold and they say, I have a right to shoot because uh, it's a 50-50 chance that there are people there. I mean, you would think, well, right. actually, that's a th th your right to shoot is actually undermined by your agnosticism. So the way I put it in the book, Defending Life, is that if the right, if, if, if we don't, if the absence of our knowledge of when life begins means, uh, a, 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 you know, abortion is justified, well, it equally, you can take it the inverse and conclude that we don't know when the right to abortion begins either, right? Because he, he says in his opinion that if Texas could show that under the 14th Amendment, the fetus is a person, then there is no right to abortion. Well, if the right to abortion is grounded in a claim that is doubtful, or, or if, the, mm -hmm. if Texas's claim of fetal personhood is doubtful and that and its entire case hinges on that, well, wouldn't it stand a reason that the right to abortion is equally doubtful? Right. I mean, right. it's just it's just bad reasoning. And yes. that's the, one of the great things about Justice Alito's uh, draft is that for the first time in my lifetime, uh, I see, I've, I've read a Supreme Court justice actually directly tackling those arguments. I mean, there are numerous other cases yeah. where there are justices in dissent who say, yeah, we'd love to overturn Roe v. Wade, but we don't have the votes. But they never kind of go after Roe. And to read Alito right. doing it and, and to rely on literature that many of us have been conversant with for decades is, 
is absolutely astonishing. Yeah, I'm sure that would be extraordinarily edifying. And as you said, I mean, even those who are um, pro-abortion uh, have definitely looked at this case and said this was really poorly decided. It's a weak decision, um, which I think is part of why there has been fear for a very long time that Roe would be overturned, right? Like the people on the left have been um, screeching about this being overturned by conservatives for a very long time. And now it's finally here. The moment is finally here. And you know, as we're talking about this, we're talking about the obvious, verifiable fact that um, it is a human at conception. Like, you aren't physically capable of creating anything other than a biological human when you reproduce as a human being. And so then the question often is kind of the goalposts move, right? Instead of, of talking about whether or not we're discussing a biological human, we often move to this discussion of this philosophical question of what makes a human a, a person worthy of value and innate dignity. And so, you know, that's a, a big portion of your book. And I would love for you to talk about, um, you know, even some of the best uh, pro-choice, pro-abortion um, philosophers, what their positions are. Because I think, too, a lot of people are somewhat familiar or have um, talked to people who are pro-abortion, and, and they're more moderate in their approach, really truly believing that, you know, it should only be reserved for those who are facing those three, the three-legged stool of fetal anomaly, um, life of the mother, and, um, oh, and fetal or what was it? Life of the mother, fetal and uh, rape, and, rape and incest. Cases of rape and incest. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, but that's, but that's not what supportive abortion bears out. I mean, taken to its logical conclusion, often it would, um, justify even infanticide. So what would you say to that? I mean, when you talk about yeah. philosophers like David Boonin and things like that, what do, what did they have to say and what are their strongest arguments? Yeah, so I actually am, I, I'm friends with David uh, <laughs> Boonin. Oh, really? Uh, That's so yeah. cool. So Dave, David and uh, I spent a year, five years ago, I was visiting professor at University of Colorado Boulder, where he is on the faculty. And we met 15 years ago, uh, I, or actually now 17 years ago, at the American Philosophical Association's Pacific Division meeting. I delivered a paper critical of portions of his book, A Defense of Abortion, and he was my respondent. He was my commentator. Oh, and wow. he was he he was very respectful and, and I was respectful of him. I mean, even though I think he's wrong about abortion, I, I like him as a person and we have a lot of common interests. And so when I would when I was in Colorado, uh, had this visiting appointment, we went hiking together. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he invited me to speak at his uh, philosophy, social philosophy colloquium, where I talked about my wow. recent work to the faculty. So, yeah, so David, David's a friend um, and he's been critical of my work in print and I of his. Uh, but David, uh, David holds uh, his position. He's got a couple of different arguments, but. What I want to do is kind of give a general overview of the types of arguments that philosophers give. So, so Boonin is well known for an argument that he takes from Judith Jarvis Thompson. So Judith Jarvis Thompson was a philosopher at MIT who, in a famous 1971 article called The Defense of Abortion, concedes for the sake of argument the pro-life position that the fetus is a person. And she says, even if the fetus is a person, it doesn't necessarily mean that abortion is not justified. And she said, she gives a certain ex kind of thought experiments to help figure out what she means. She said, one of them is a famous, uh, there's actually several of them are kind of quasi famous in philosophy. And, and one of them is actually well known sort of among those that follow this debate outside of philosophy. Uh, the one that she uses that most people are aware of is the case of the unconscious violinist. So you arrive at a uh, so society of music lovers party, un unbeknownst to you, you are knocked out and taken to this secret uh, hospital room where you are hooked up to a unconscious violinist. You know, there's a kind of tube that's connected to you and there's a contraption in the middle and the, uh, the same as of the violinist and it, you wake up and the doctor tells you, look, um, the, this violinist needs your kidneys for nine months. 
Uh, we've scanned the entire world and we've discovered that you are the only person on earth that has the right blood type to help this violinist. Don't worry, all you have to do is be hooked up for nine months. If you unplug yourself from the violinist before that, he will die. Since violinists are persons and all persons have a right to life, you should not unplug yourself from the violinist. So that's one of our arguments. The other one, and that's supposed to be kind of analogous to rape. Uh, the other argument, the other analogies are, there's several of them and just one of, another one is, you know, you open up your window to let in fresh air and a burglar sneaks in. Is the burglar entitled to stay at your house? Right, and of course the burglar is analogous to an unborn human being. And she's supposing though you put bars on your window, the bars being analogous to contraception, but nevertheless the uh, burglar is clever or tiny and he's able to go through the bars. Um, does he still have to stay? Or imagine that there are these seeds drifting in the air uh, and you put up a screen so the seeds don't enter your home, but the, some of them sneak through. And if they embed themselves in your carpet or your upholstery, there will, they will develop into people seeds that, uh, now do you have to take care of the people that are born of the people seeds? Now you see, you see the point, right? Of all of them, right? The right. attempt and is the to sort and of- And there are underlying assumptions and pre, you know, presumptions that she doesn't even bother to prove. Right. Like it's just assumed that there is not, um, you know, there's no duty on behalf of the mother towards the child in any sense of whatever. They're always an intruder or parasitic, basically, um, which kind of denies the natural relationship between the mother and the child for one. Right. That's right. And she kind of hand waves that away. So that's something she brings up yeah. towards the end of her article. She says, you know, what, what about the fact that it's this child is the mother's? It's her, it's her child. And they go, well, sure, she goes, surely we do not have any rights or obligations until, until we explicitly accept them. And so the illust she, she uses an illustration for this. She, she says, for example, if a couple decides not to procure an abortion and the woman gives birth and they bring the child home from the hospital, they have at that point assumed responsibility. But th this actually raises the question, well, why that couple? In other words, the, the, you know, why is it that that couple gets to bring that child home, right? I mean, she's already assuming right. responsibility, right? So why can't the government or the hospital simply, you know, cast lots or, her, uh, or you know, choose parents that are qualified, that pass a test? Why right. is it those two, That's they get to bring point. child home? So she already is playing with the rhetorical structure of the pro-life intuitions, right? And she doesn't know it. Right, right. And two, I think, what about the parent that decides they no longer uh, want to have, um, you know, they don't want that responsibility anymore? Um, would it be wrong for them to kill the child then in that case? Because we talk about consent all the time these days and consent is fluid, right? And so we can at one time consent to something and then revoke our consent later. And I don't ever see people talking about that, at least not in an intellectually honest yeah. fashion. Um, it's always assumed that, well, they took the baby home and that's the end of the story. But from a philosophical standpoint, when you take things to their logical end, um, you can see, you know, trotting out the toddler, that why isn't that a viable option? That, that, that's, that's correct. Now, technically, they could say, they could say, well, you know, a, a parent could put up their child for adoption at any time, right? So technically right. you could, but, but of course that doesn't entail you have a right to kill the child, right? And, and right. it was inter interesting. Imagine this, imagine we, uh, uh, we knew of a parent that said, um, uh, I will, um, let's say, brings the child home. The child grows up to be seven or eight years old. And they, and let's say they, they, they need, let's say, um, uh, five hundred thousand dollars to attend graduate school and go to law school, and they can't afford it. So what they do is they sell their child, right? Uh, and what precisely would be wrong with that, right? I mean, under under the, the sort of modern liberal contractual way that we look at relationships, right? Now, most people, I think virtually everyone, would recoil in horror of that. Or supposing somebody that lost a child as a gambling bet, 
right? Like, okay, I'm going to bet on yes. the, you know, what can you, what collateral you can put up for the Patriots? Well, uh, my eight year old, right? I mean, you, you would, you right. would think that that was right. dehumanizing, right? And, and yet if, if somebody, what if I said, well, yeah, but this other couple, they've got a lot more money and they're more educated and they can probably treat my kid better. I mean, we, we think, I think intuitively and correctly that there is a special relationship that the idea that uh, that mere physical goods are an adequate justification to put your child up for sale <laughs> seems to right. just weird be weird. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and too, I know there. It looks like maybe there's a little bit of a delay on here, so I'm sorry about that. But yeah. you know, you raise the question of um, you know gambling our children away, and I always think so far the the most um, fascinating response that I have seen in terms of um, discussing the bodily autonomy argument from the you know because I do think that that's the most sophisticated argument that the pro choicer has. I think. Me personally, I think that's their strongest argument, um, especially when they say, well, consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy. And, you know, as much as you and I can sit here and go, well, I've, yes, it is, because that's the natural end of sexual intercourse. Um, but you're right. If you're actively contracepting or whatever, then, yeah, I guess you weren't actively consenting to pregnancy. You were trying to prevent it. Um, however, that's just not always how that's just not how nature works. So well, the best argument I have heard, sorry, is um, yeah. to say, well, like consent to gambling. What if, you can't say, like, for example, that I consented to gamble, but I didn't consent to losing all my money. Right. Like that yeah. is a best the best analogy I've seen in discussing this question. Honestly, what do you think about that? I, I think analogies are, are, are good to use, counter analogies. So one that I've used uh, is one that doesn't involve consent at all. It, it's a case, the case of the woman that lives at the North Pole. I use this in, in defending life. So imagine there's a woman mm -hmm. that lives at the North Pole in a cabin all by herself. She has only one means of communication that she can use only nine, every, once every nine months. Uh, but she's wealthy, so she so she's able to, uh, you know, have brought to her every couple of months goods and services. You know, so one time she wakes up, goes to her front door to to retrieve all the food and resources uh, that she needs, and lo and behold, there's a baby in a bassinet at the front door, and there's a note in the bassinet, and it says. All you have to do is take care of this child for nine months. I'll be back in nine months. Now, would she have a right to leave the child outside on the doorstep and let the wolves eat it? Right. And, 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 and I've, I've never had a student in my, see how many years I've used that analogy. So I came up with that analogy in, for defending life. So I think about almost 20 years I've used it. I've never had one student say, no, that would be okay to leave the child out there. I think because in that the reason why I use that analogy by that I, I have to say I'm surprised yeah, so, by that because I have heard people say the most outrageous things when I've talked to them about abortion on on college campuses. Yeah, I think it's maybe different in, when you're in a classroom situation and you you really can't like walk away, right? I mean, you you, you know yeah. you have to. I think you have to have a straight face in that in that type of context. I mean, people could say things like "I don't care." I mean, you know, people say things, but I think if you're in a in a, a, a classroom context where, let's say, you you you've been with the same people for at least a month, you know, you can't sort of pull that kind of right. you know rhetorical uh, um, ingenuity. Right. Yeah, yeah, like just being that's right. Yeah. So I, I, I use that extreme example because there's no actual, she's not responsible for the child and it's a stranger, right? So that example yeah. is, is, that's a little bit extreme. Now, I do think, and I have a actually a book chapter coming out in about two months. I was asked to contribute to a book edited by one of my former students. It's called um, Agency, Pregnancy and Persons, Essay, New Essays in Defense of Human Life. And in it, I challenge the whole idea that you need an analogy to understand pregnancy. That, that in fact, we use parenthood as, an analo as a way to explain other things. 
So think about, let's say, the elderly neighbor lady who's not your mom and somebody says, oh, she treats you like a daughter, right? Or, 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 we, right. Or, or, we, or we think of, oh, she's very motherly to her students or he's a paternal figure for his players, right? So we already, in other words, we use parenthood to explain other things. We don't actually mm -hmm. say, well, what a mystery this parenthood thing is. <laughs> Right. Well, let's right. find an analogy yes. to explain it. And so, so it was one of the one of these kind of beatific or epiphanies. I wouldn't say beatific vision. That's seeing God. Epiphany is is sort of getting an insight. So, I remember about uh, yeah. when, when when my student uh, Nick Colgrove said, "Could you think of something new to write on abortion you've not written before?" I thought, "Huh, I've always wanted to kind of challenge this idea of of analogy." And so, I finally put it down on paper and. And I think, you know, when I tried it out with my students, it kind of resonated with them. Uh, you know, I, I well, think it should, partly it's because part of our nature. That's right. You know, that's a, that's, that's right. A, so, you know, I, yeah, that's, that's right. I think so. Think about other things that we know about that we use to explain other things. So like people will say, uh, Texas, uh, football in Texas is like religion. But nobody says religion is like football in Texas, right? Because right. we, we already know what religion is. Uh, if somebody, think about all the aphorisms and sayings that we have about meals. Like, uh, it's, it's like taking candy from a baby, the last supper, meals on wheels, right? So we, why, do, why do those work, right? It's because we already know what nutrition is, right? We already know what eating is. If we want to, we don't want, we don't explain um, uh, intravenous feeding. We, we, somebody says to you, oh, what's eating like? Oh, it's like intravenous, except for you're using the esophagus and mouth, right? It's the other way around, right? Right. And but what do you think about, because we live in a time right now in which um, the definitions for virtually everything regarding human nature are being rewritten, right? And so we actually do kind of lack, even though innately we all have a com common understanding of these things, especially as it's rooted in human sexuality. Um, but at the same time, there's this huge push to rewrite our understanding and, and that innate knowledge that we have. How do you think that, will that continue to resonate? Will your writing or, or you know, sharing this resonate? Yeah. Or do you think it will fall flat because of that inability to see our human nature for what it is? Yeah, I, I think it's because the rewriting is a form of plagiarism. And what I mean by that, in order for the rewriting to occur, you have to know what the original thing is. So think, for example, um, of the ways in which, and I, I, I didn't intend to get into this issue, but you know, some of the debates about transgenderism, right? When, when, when you hear, and I don't, I don't claim to be an expert in this area, but I, I'm just relying on what I've read in the popular press and the, the little academic material that I've encountered. But whenever you hear somebody say something like, I feel like a boy or I feel like a girl, well, they have to know what that is, right? Yes. Uh, they already yes. have to have a, a reference, right? So like, so like when you see, for example, when, when Bruce Jenner transitions to Caitlyn Jenner, he doesn't dress like a, he dresses like a flamboyant version of the stereotypical woman, right? right. He doesn't, he doesn't dress like Ellen DeGeneres, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, so there, yes. there is a sense in which, <laughs> no, and, and I don't, and, and I, and I want to be clear here. I think, and I think, that's a, a stereotypical way to think about women. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting sure. that Ellen DeGeneres is not dressing like a woman. In fact, one of the things I've told my students when they've, when the few times where I've, you know, offered my opinion on it when they've asked is that I think it's a mistake to think that there's one way to be a woman or one way to be a man. So if let's say there's a, a young man that happens to like things that we associate 
with women, we shouldn't say, well, you must really be a woman. It may be that you yeah. actually are a man that is drawn to things that we tend to associate with femininity, but are things that men have been good at as well. Right. So, you know, right. ima imagine, you know, uh, w when I was in high school, I, I was a sports guy. I played basketball and ran track and cross country, but I also liked poetry and Broadway musicals, right? Does that make mm -hmm. me, you know, and, and so girls like that tended to like that more than boys did, at least in, in, in high school. Now that made it easier for me to date girls right? <laughs> because I could, but, but that was just, you know, that that's, but I think it's a mistake for us to kind of stereotype those gender roles. So, but getting back to the fact that we actually struggle with this and the fact that we uh, think about it in these terms means we do have a kind of baseline or foundation, right? We do have kind of general understandings of how men and women are. And that's why certain types of humor work, right? So, yes. you know, um, so I, I uh, said, I, when I get together sometimes with my male friends who are married and we talk about our wives, like once in a while, one of my friends say, I think we're married to the same person. Right. Yeah. You know, so well, there's, yeah, there's, there's, cause there's, there are commonalities. You, yeah. Right. Um, so kind of along the lines of like understanding the nature of the human person, um, and the dignity that we have, what is the strongest argument that you have for, um, for kind of addressing that to somebody who's more atheistic or agnostic in their understanding of God, right? We always want to, I don't know, people always want to fight this um, battle more on a secular level, but at the end of the day, it's kind of hard to, because we, uh, we are endowed with dignity, right? Otherwise we're just like all the other animals. If, it, if we didn't have this intellect and will, um, you know, we can all understand that there's something distinct and unique about being human. So what is it for you? Like, what do you think is the strongest argument to combat things like, um, you know, bodily autonomy and just addressing in general, um, yeah. our, our, uh, I think there's a, there's, there's a, there's a different ways to think about this question. So one, you can appeal initially to the biological facts of human development. We, we know a lot about how human beings develop. Human beings begin as uh, early uh, at conception when sperm and ovum unite, you have a zygote that is its own uh, individual organism. And from that point forward, all you have is sort of the unfolding of the nature that is present at the very beginning. And people who defend abortion rights, at least in the philosophical literature, do not deny that. Now, there are a few people that quibble about the first 14 days because during the first 14 days there's the possibility of twinning. But let's set that question aside. So let's assume for the sake of argument, there's no twinning controversy. And let's just also, let's just say after 14 days, okay, after conception, you have an individual living human organism. Now, in my book, I defend uh, personhood from the very beginning, but we'll just ignore the 14 days issue. And besides, most women don't discover that they're pregnant until far long after that. So right. what you have is a individual living organism of the human species who develops and unfolds a nature that is present from the beginning and that certain powers and perfections and attributes develop in ways that we're all very familiar with, right? At a, you know, at, even after birth, right? Child is born, it doesn't immediately speak. It eventually achieves a kind of self-awareness. Uh, it's able to engage in complex thinking. Uh, it's able to make judgments. Uh, it takes maybe two or three years for that. Uh, all these things mm -hmm. occur as part of normal human development. Well, certain philosophers have argued that that yes, it is a human being uh, from the moment of conception or maybe 14 days after, but it's not a person until it can manifest certain characteristics. These characteristics are things mm -hmm. like the ability to communicate, have a self-concept, uh, think rationally, uh, problem solve, have an idea of one's right to life, things of the, this sort. So 
I think the problem with that view is that at bottom it confuses being a person with functioning as a person. So let me give you some sort of counterexamples. So one is that when you're asleep or unconscious or temporarily comatose, you exhibit none of those personhood characteristics. Now, someone could say, well, but you did in the past, right? My question is, well, why does the past necessarily matter? I mean, imagine you had twins uh, who, we'll call them Tony and Tina. Let's say Tony was born in a coma and Tina was born in a coma. They each, let's say, survive, uh, uh, and develop and the doctor tells you look Tina's gonna uh, come out of the coma uh, Tony will stay in it until he's five years old and so Tina comes out of the coma for a minute and during that minute she exhibits those personhood characteristics and then drops back into the coma again it just seems weird to say you could kill Tony but not Tina that is the only difference is that she had for a minute <laughs> exhibited these person-giving characteristics. Another problem with the view is that those characteristics are on a continuum. That is, we all have them in different degrees. Some of us are more rational, more intelligent, less intelligent. We have different gifts and abilities. And yet, if we believe that human beings are in some sense equal, we can't ground it in abilities that come in degrees. And so if, in fact, you want to say that human rights depends on degreed properties, that means rights should be treated in degrees as well. And I think in today's day and age, the idea that people with, let's say, disabilities should have fewer rights than people who are otherwise healthy seems to be you know, something that people would recoil against. Uh, I think another problem is that, uh, here I'm gonna give a, uh, my own uh, thought experiment uh, imagine there was a, uh, a mad scientist, we'll call him Dr. Eugene X, or well, I say a better one, Hugh Genix. Uh, Dr. Hugh Genix uh, is a mad scientist and in his laboratory, he, fer he creates embryos through in vitro fertilization and then at a certain point in development stops the neural tube from developing so that he could harvest the organs of these children when they get when they get larger. Uh, the reason why stopping the neural tube is important is that for him is that if you do that, then higher brain functions never arise, and then the child never becomes quote unquote a person. Now imagine though a group of pro life radicals breaks into the laboratory, takes all those embryos to another laboratory, where a group of pro life scientists heals those those uh, developing embryos and then they are subsequently planted in rooms and they are then uh, born and are adopted by loving families. Uh, were, was justice done in that case? If you believe justice is done in that case, that means that you believe that even before human beings function as human beings, they are in fact persons. So that's, I, I think, you know, that's a way to think about the personhood question. Um, that what makes us persons is not how we behave or how we act, it's what, it, it's what we are. As we talk about like, yeah, this notion of personhood, then what are the implications that we have, especially when we talk about human beings from conception, having dignity regardless of degree of function or personifying, I guess, this understanding of humanness, which can vary depending on who you talk to quite a, quite a yeah. bit. Um, what are the implications then on a broader scale when we start talking about IVF, um, surrogacy? Because to me, it just feels like because we've degraded our understanding of the human being and we have treated humans as property, especially our children, we live in a culture that really um, treats children as property. And, and so now we have the commodification of children kind of being transferred into these other things under the guise of, of compassion, right? Trying to help couples that, who are struggling with infertility or what have you. So what are your thoughts on how this bears out for those other issues like IVF and surrogacy? Yeah, so those issues, I mean, are obviously they're different. They involve people oftentimes that have a legitimate and obviously natural inclination to care for their children. 
to actually bring children into being, mm -hmm. right? They want to have right. a family, which ironically actually counts against the Thompson argument, right? The fact that you have ordinary people trying to fulfill a good to which they're ordered, right? It seems mm -hmm. to violate the whole idea of that all our relationships are merely contractual. Uh, right. But, so I think it's part of a legitimate inclination, but the fact that you have a legitimate inclination and a legitimate desire and one that ought to, in some sense, be fulfilled doesn't mean that any means to fulfill it is justified. And so the idea that, um, you know, treating children, and, and I, again, I want to be clear here that I don't think people that do this are actually consciously treating children as commodities, no. but, but there's a way in which the method itself uh, objectifies the child and the child becomes no longer a uh, result of a union ordered towards love but a product to be, uh, I wouldn't want to say purchased because technically that's not what happens, but at least the process is purchased. And right. so the reason, and you've seen cases where uh, couples that, uh, that, that you will have s uh, women that will uh, either uh, you know, become pregnant uh, as a result of in, uh, not only uh, artificial insemination, so it would be actually technically be her child, or cases of in vitro fertilization where the, the, an embryo that is, doesn't have any of her genetic materials implanted in her, that she is actually uh, engaging in an activity that is part of the tenderness and care that one has for one's own children with the end of giving that child over to yeah. another couple, in, in some cases, the, it's the, the genetic material of, of, of the couple, but it's, it's, it, it's instrumentalizes her pregnancy. So in a weird way, you know, the, the, you're, you're, the very thing that, that a lot of pro-choice people accuse pro-lifers of, namely treating the woman as an incubator is precisely what happens in this kind of <laughs> yes. liberal way of thinking about reproduction. If anything, it, 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 it does the very thing that that, um, that accusation, uh, you know, I think is falsely uh, employed yeah. against uh, pro-lifers. But uh, yeah, and ironically, there are, in fairness here, there are, there are several feminist thinkers who oppose uh, surrogacy for precisely that reason. So, I mean, it's, uh, I don't want to sort of paint with a broad brush here. There are, there are you know, people, good people of goodwill that, uh, that I disagree with on abortion who, who for reasons having to do with the, the instrumentalization, exploitation of women, you know, oppose surrogacy. Right. And two, I think even in, in these cases that you're describing, um, you, you know, pro-lifers are often accused of not caring about the child after the child is born. And, you know, we look at this situation with surrogacy and we say, but what about the child after it's born? And now the only person that this child has ever known is the woman with which they grew within and created this innate physiological bond with this child. Um, and now you're separating the, the child away from the only person that they know to be their mother. Um, even if not in a biological sense, in a physiological sense, it's true. And, and there is a trauma that happens when you sever that bond, regardless of if the child is biologically her child, um, because they, they have grown in this, in this way together. Yeah. And the, the thing, the thing that I think is that a lot of, a lot of people who, let's say, were born after the 1980s that you guys you guys don't have a memory of a world where adoption was really about trying to make the best of a difficult situation so a lot of yes. children that were adopted were uh, put up for adoption so oftentimes by unwed mothers or um, you know situations in which let's say both par the children were orphaned right as a result of parents who died, uh, uh, or parents that were 
so far gone in drug addiction things. So there was it was seen to be like the society's best way to remedy mm-hmm. a very difficult situation. It's not ideal, and so we try to replicate in the adoption what they lost. Right, so. They lost a mother and father, right? So we're trying to replicate, right, as best we can. Now adoption is seen as almost a kind of, in these cases, as a kind of alternative to ordinary human procreation when there's nothing that prevents those people from actually having children procreatively. (laughs) And I just think yes. that's, it's just, to, and, and it sounds, it seems so weird to me that, that it's mm-hmm. become, it's gone from child focused to adult focused. Like I can't really yes. be fulfilled as a human being unless I have a child. And my wife and I, by the way, are childless. This entitlement. And it, and it wasn't, it, oh, it, it, my, I'm sorry. it wasn't intended. We just, we just, you know, didn't, it just didn't happen. Right. And uh, about 15, 20 years ago, we thought about adoption and, you know, realistically, given the way our lives had become so busy, it, we, we didn't think it was the right thing to do. But, you know, I and I sometimes we sometimes when I have students over or my wife and I go to a Baylor event and we see young students and uh, or let's say a couple of grad students. Uh, I will some, you know, we'll either lean over to each other and say, you know, she seems like she could have been our daughter, you know, just because of personality or things like that. So, yeah, there's a, I understand that, that, that desire, you know, that That people have uh, and that, that longing, but you know, um, that, I think that's, you're, you're short changing yourself in a sense. You're, you know, you, you can have a fulfilling life otherwise. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And well, there's not, there's an entitlement, I think, that people have. um, And that's also a part of um, my age demographic. I think a lot of us have grown up feeling entitled to certain things, to many things. um, And that's just not, that's not the case. And I think, too, at an age when we're trying to, you know, work around everything and be, be our own gods then that's kind of a, a natural thing to do there as well is to be our own gods and, and make those things happen. Whereas previously people would wrestle with those things and, um, and use those types of losses or things in their own lives for the good, instead of sensing that they were entitled to it. Um, they, they wrestled with it and became better people for it. I think. We also live in a world and I think, Angela, you're right about all those things. I want to add to that, though, the, the fact that in the, in the past, families were less fragmented, that yes. the extended families. So uh, in my own family, there, was, uh, there were like a, one or two cousins that didn't have kids, right, for reasons of infertility. Uh, so you kind of knew people like that, right? And then, then there were, you know, people like my parents that had four kids and... Uh, others, you know, that maybe had five or six, right? So there was, there was kind of different, you know, kind, so you saw, you had experience with people within your own family that lived that, you know, a life, a uh, fulfilling life in, in different ways, right? And you also had the support of family members, right? So if you, if you didn't have kids, you'd still be there at Thanksgiving and Christmas at everybody, right? right? Or at the birthday parties. And, and there's less of that today, right? There's, yes. there's fewer... You know, I think of my own uh, my own family. I, I'm the eldest of four, and uh, my mother had two miscarriages when I was mm. a kid. And so, um, uh, on the day of my dad's funeral, we were walk. The th- four of us were walking from his gravesite with my mom, and I looked at my siblings, looked at my mom, and I said, "I wish, I wish you, I wish there were more of us." And you know, I love my siblings, and that's that that kind of world is is unfamiliar to a lot of young people, right? Yeah. Where you yeah. just kind of enjoyed that, and that was you know to me, I like hanging out with my siblings, joking about stuff in the past, <laughs> you know, yeah. how we grew up, and so 
any event, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like, you know, uh, old man yell at cloud kind of guy, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I do think that, you know, we, we, we shouldn't sell ourselves short, you know, in, in right. terms of our resiliency. And I think one way that we can repair that is to, you know, make an effort to, to restore our own communities. And, mm. you know, especially if you're, if you're Catholic or you're part of a church or a synagogue, uh, you know, there's ways that, that those communities can be a start for returning to that, that older way of thinking. Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, um, I definitely appreciate all of your insight on Roe and um, how we understand the philosophy of, of the dignity of the human person. But I want to ask one more question before I sort of give you an opportunity to let people know where they can find you and your work. And that last question is, what do you think is going to happen when Roe is overturned um, mm. in the country? Like, what are you expecting or bracing yourself for specifically? <laughs> Yeah, so I, um, I don't know. I, I, let me think. I, I've been thinking about this, so um, I, I think it's gonna. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, before I answer the question directly, interesting to see the different opinion. So I mean, we did get a draft opinion by by Justice Alito, but there surely will be dissents and concurring yes. opinions, assuming that, and of course. Uh, Alito's opinion may be twice as large, right? Because he's going to have to respond to either concurrences or dissents, right? If they if they make right. arguments that challenge some something that he had written, because we all we saw is his initial draft or the final draft mm -hmm. before responses by the other justices. So I think legally, I think I think Roe and Casey will both be overturned. Um, I think in terms of our politics, I think that um, there will be a, a huge marches in the streets. Uh, I think that every uh, community uh, that has a capital or a, a downtown area with a city hall will have protests. Um, I don't think that... Uh, uh, so that's immediately, I think that's what's going to happen. And I wouldn't be surprised, uh, given what, what little we've seen, what we've seen so far, even though it's not been a lot, that uh, crisis pregnancy centers and churches that clearly identify themselves as pro-life, I think, will be defaced. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that there will be, I think that there will be violence. Um, I think if, you know, think about it, if you have been indoctrinated to believe two things. If you believe that people that are oppressed can't do wrong and uh, and you believe you're oppressed, you think, for example, that Roe v. Wade overturn, being overturned makes you oppressed, that means that you will, at least consciously or subconsciously, believe that you have a license to destroy property and other human beings. So I think some people, will, no, I, I, I want to be fair here, I think there are people that will oppose this overturning who I think are, will not do, lots of people will not do that. Right. Uh, friends of mine who I think are decent people will not do that. But I do think in terms of the kind of radical activist class, I think you'll, you'll, you will see some of that. Uh, I think mm -hmm. long term, I think uh, within, you know, within a couple of weeks, we'll have legislatures depending on the state, blue and red states, passing legislation that will either uh, restrict abortion significantly or liberalize it even further than Roe. And I think we've seen that already in California and New York, ahead of the schedule. Uh, I think by the time we hit the November 2022 20, election, it will all be forgotten. I actually think that, that, and the reason why I think that is I've seen what happened in Texas. Texas passed a, what is called a heartbeat law and there was a lot of hoopla when it was first passed uh, last year and then when it became effective in September. And nothing's really, and people just have moved on. And so I, I do think uh, part of the reason for that is that we, we live in a culture because of social media and the fact that the way that overturning Roe will affect different states differently, I don't think it will be... Uh, I don't think it will have any effect on the 2022 election in terms of um, 
get out the vote. I think if, if it does have an effect, it will have effect on both sides and they'll cancel each other out. Thank you for um, sharing with us your insight on what, and, and it'll be interesting to see if uh, what you are preparing for kind of bears out. That's kind of mm -hmm. what I think will happen too. Um, but where can listeners find you and your work? Yeah, so I have a website, francisbeckwith.com. That's F-R-A-N-C-I-S B-E-C-K-W-I-T-H dot com. And it has, you know, lots of my articles, uh, both popular and academic, and links to my to my books on Amazon and publishers and a little bio and things of that sort. Excellent. Thanks for coming on today, Dr. Beckwith. And hopefully maybe someday you'll come back on. That'd be great, Angela. Thank you for having me. God bless you. If you enjoyed this episode of Integrated, please like and subscribe here on YouTube and your favorite podcasting platform. Integrated with Angela Erickson is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Check the description box for how you can connect with me on social media. And if you are so inclined, prayerfully consider supporting Integrated on Patreon to help offset the cost of production. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to live life integrated. God bless you.